about free substitution uh, for schools. Um, yeah, by f it was uh, done by Finn Godau. Uh, thank you for the translators uh, for translating into German. Let's start. In general, as you know, teachers can't always teach as planned. So students need to be informed when their lessons are moved in time or space or both or don't take place as they should or they have a different teacher, all that. And for that, schools create a substitution plan. Uh, there's software for that, uh, for example, UNTIS. And these substitution plans need to be distributed. And in Germany, a lot of schools use Digitales Schwarzes Brett or Digital Signage Board or DSB for that. Uh, it works like this. Um, well, yeah, and it works like this: uh, that the school uploads the plan, pupils can read this substitution plan on these DSB screens on their mobile devices using the client software developed by Heineken Media and using the website once they have the credentials that they acquired from their school. It's one pair of username and password for all pupils and one for all teachers. Oh, well, and this costs money. Schools buy way too expensive screens from Heineken Media and then the schools pay extra for this uh, fantastic web interface here where you can sign in and view your substitution plans. You can also use this mobile app. It's not really good though, as I will explain. Um, this is what it looks like. Things are tiny, as you can see. It's obviously proprietary software. It depends on Google Play services. You need to zoom around, you need to scroll around to see all the information because it's so tiny. Uh, so this is super suboptimal. Um, I don't even know why this is so small. If you look it up on a web browser, it zooms fine when you have a smaller device. And I, I really don't know how that is screwed up like that. It has useless push notifications like new content available. It's not, not useful. And you have to click at least one time too much all the time. And due to these issues, I always wanted something that is better than DSB Mobile. So I began capturing DSB Mobile's network traffic. Surprisingly, in Android, this is really easy. Um, you can use user-friendly software like HTTP Canary, which is this one, or Packet Capture, which is this one. It's unfortunately proprietary, but I don't know any non-proprietary software for this. If you know any, please tell me. Um, it acts like a VPN provider app and proxies all the traffic that is going out uh, through it, installs a certificate in your system, so that apps still think that the network connection is secure. And then this app will decrypt and store and re-encrypt all the traffic that is going out and in. So you can read it then. Uh, this is essentially like a attacker in the middle attack well, that you're doing yourself on your own network traffic. Uh, yeah, except on recent Android versions, apparently Android doesn't trust certificates that you install anymore, so you actually now have to have root access to move them to this location slash system slash etc slash security slash CA certs so that they, they are ultimately trusted. And this is unfortunate because it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, but in older Android versions, it works really easy. Um, with more effort, this capturing of network traffic can be circumvented by uh, implementing a kind of certificate pinning so that the app checks beforehand which certificates it trusts and which it doesn't. With more effort, such a prevention could also be circumvented, uh, but DSP Mobile didn't have that. So I could figure out how this endpoint works. As you can see, it's called the iPhone service on Android. <laughs> Using your user ID and a password, you can request an auth token. It has the form of this. 
actually, that's what it looks like uh, when you have invalid credentials. So if it returns this, then your credentials are not valid. It never changes, so I don't know what the use of this token is. Um, however, DSB Mobile never stored it, even though it's the same all the time. Uh, so it took one extra round trip time every login to fetch this never changing auth token. Using this auth token, you can request your substitution plan URL. And then once you have this substitution plan URL, you can access your substitution plan. OK, so using this knowledge, I developed a client that allows me to directly have access to just the relevant information, and I call it DSB Direct. Uh, the very first thing it did better than DSB Mobile is that it displayed things not as tiny. This is a kind of old screenshot. As you can see, um, these HTML files here can be parsed using a parser, and such that uh, you can filter it, you can um, have useful notifications that I added later on. This is a native list, not a web view, so it has it feels better. And uh, yeah, of course it's not proprietary, but free software. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, this logo, uh, it's supposed to represent my school's logo, uh, this one. Mm. Yeah, please don't tell me I did too bad, OK? At least it's different from the DSB mobile logo. This endpoint is fun in other regards. Uh, the first time I encountered it, it allowed completely unencrypted connections, and the website did not redirect users to HTTPS. So actually, you'd most of the time input your username and password and transmit it unsecurely. <laughs> it supported up to TLS version 1.0 which is obsolete. It supported SSL version 2, which enables a drown attack, which I didn't quite understand, but apparently those aren't very likely to be exploited here, but it could allow attackers to read your traffic. I informed the company about this on August 11th, and I believe this is when I introduced the not my fault grumble tag in the issue tracker. tracker. They were happy to be informed about this, on August 22nd, they enabled TLS version 1.2, disabled SSL version 2, uh, still allowed insecure connections, and I also noticed that they embedded fonts from Google, and this is obviously bad for privacy, so I told them about that uh, twice. September 19th, the iPhone service 404 is if the connection is insecure. However, Google Fonts are still embedded. Anyhow, it's October 4th that the iPhone service is shut down. So I start focusing on the new endpoint that apparently the DSB apps have been using for a while that I didn't notice that. Uh, so I had to figure out how this data format works. Looks like this. Uh, so you can see it has a JSON body uh, using uh, which has a request, which is an object that has data, which is a string. So I wanted to figure out how to read this. It looks like base 64 when unescaping these, these slashes, of course, because it's encoded in JSON. Um, However, decoding this JSON string here did not, uh, this base64 string did not deliver a nice result. Uh, so I had to look for clues by decompiling the app. There are online tools for that. Uh, unfortunately, the app was minified, or which is obfuscated during compile time, which made the results not very readable, which means that once you have it decompiled, you will have first function in each class appears as A, and the second one as B or something. Fortunately, I, I don't remember how exactly I did that. So instead, we're going to have to look at whether this was legal or not, uh, because that's interesting too. 
uh, because I think it is. Let's look at paragraph 69e URHG, Copyright Law, Urheberrechtsgesetz, die Kompilierung. Die Zustimmung des Rechteinhabers ist nicht erforderlich, wenn die, und hier steht Vervielfältigung des Codes oder die Übersetzung der Codeform im Sinne der Paragraph 9610 Nummer 1 und 2, gemeint ist Dekompilierung, unerlässlich ist, um die erforderlichen Informationen zur Herstellung der Interoperabilität eines unabhängig geschaffenen Computerprogrammes mit anderen Programmen zu erhalten, sofern folgende Bestimmungen erfüllt sind. So it says, you may decompile without permission, when it is strictly necessary, while trying to create interoperability between two programs created independently from each other, under these conditions. And here are three conditions. Um, die Handlungen werden von dem Lizenznehmer oder einer anderen zur Verwendung eines Vervielfältigungsstückes des Programms berechtigten Person oder in deren Namen von einer hierzu ermächtigten Person vorgenommen. It says, you must have permission to use the program. Yay, I think I'm allowed to use the program. I'm assuming I am, my school paid for it. Second, die für die Herstellung der Interoperabilität notwendigen Informationen sind für die in Nummer 1 genannten Personen noch nicht ohne weiteres zugänglich gemacht. So, the information you want to know is not already provided. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, Heineken Media didn't document this, obviously. So, yeah, that's for full. Third, die Handlungen beschränken sich auf die Teile des ursprünglichen Programms, die zur Herstellung der Interoperabilität notwendig sind. So, you're only decompiling the part that contains the information you want to know. Uh, yeah, I don't think this Android app is divided into parts, so let's just, let's just skip that. Uh, the law text goes on stating three things you may not do with the information you gain from decompiling. Bei Handlungen nach Absatz 1 gewonnene Informationen dürfen nicht zu anderen Zwecken als zur Herstellung der Interoperabilität des unabhängig geschaffenen Programms verwendet werden. So don't use it for other purposes than creating interoperability, interoperability with the independently created program. Uh, yeah, of course I never use my knowledge for any other reasons. Never. An Dritte weitergegeben werden, es sei denn, dass dies für die Interoperabilität des unabhängig geschaffenen Programms notwendig ist. So don't tell third parties about the information unless necessary for interoperability. Ah, uh, yes. My free software implementation couldn't be interoperable if the information wasn't public, unless it was non-free software, which it is not, obviously. Für die Entwicklung, Herstellung oder Vermarktung eines Programms mit im Wesentlichen ähnlicher Ausdrucksform oder für irgendwelche anderen das Urheberrecht verletzenden Handlungen verwendet werden. So, don't violate the rest of the copyright law? Of course we're not. Surely creating an alternative to something on its own doesn't violate copyright law, right? So yay, after doing it, I discovered that I did so legally. Uh, so I found a usage of some class related to gzip, so I tried around a bit and figured you could use this command to decrypt this string. And guess what it is? It's more JSON! <laughs> what an efficient data format! We're hiding our encoded JSON inside more JSON! Let's look at the data we're sending. Of course, we have a user ID and a pass. Besides that, we have a lot of data apparently for statistics. You have the apps version, you have the package ID, the device model, the Android version, and API level, the user's language, and the current date. I don't know why you have the date. I, I think they know the date that the query arrives at, but yeah, you, you have that anyway. You have a, oh sorry. Some of this is redundant from the request header or user agent that is already sent. I don't know why they do that twice. Um, you have app ID, which is a unique per installation ID, which I at first didn't know how to generate. And you have push ID, which is, I'm assuming, an ID generated by Google Mobile Services, now known as Google Play Services, to enable push notifications. So it becomes obvious that they're able to link requests together and possibly create usage patterns. What are they doing with this data? No clue, there's no privacy policy anywhere. Which of these fields are required? 
all of them but push ID, but most st strings can be left empty. So DSP Direct sent the minimal amount of requested data, which is everything but with empty strings. And yeah, actually, guess what? This server allows insecure connections again. So uh, something happened. Um, on some date, the server-side verification of this query was changed, and the field app version suddenly became mandatory. I ran some experiments and found examples of valid and invalid version names. These are examples of valid version names. These are examples of invalid version names. Finally, app versions that aren't real versions of Heineken Media's apps are accepted anyhow, like version 7.0.oi. We only add version 2.5. I, I don't remember, 6, I uh, think. So DSP Rate started sending along some app version on its own, actually, which was 2.5 and the same as an older DSP Mobile release. And because I thought maybe they'd have more server-side changes in the future, I implemented a new system. It was to prevent server-side changes from requiring an update, because that would mean I have to write change logs, because after it releases are slow, because the one who was uploading it to Google Play for me also always took a while. And because of that, there was now a look for a fix button that creates the news file, which is located at the repository's root, which allows me to inform users when they can expect a fix. It allows me to change this base JSON that credentials are appended to, which is this without the user ID and user password. So they're added to this JSON later. And in case they check that, I added an option to send the real date. I thought maybe that's what they would do next. They, they never did that, unfortunately. Uh, this was the same release as the one with the version number fix, this one. Uh, we have good news elsewhere, though. It was the same day, October 15th, uh, that I received an email that app.dsbcontrol.de was no longer accessible on port 80 and that Google Fonts were now being loaded locally. This email contained no usual bei Rückfragen können Sie sich gerne direkt an mich wenden, unfortunately. Maybe they didn't want to hear from me anymore. I, I couldn't verify this at first. Uh, October 16th, I could verify this, so a friend noted that they have slow deploy times, apparently. Uh, round three, it's October 17th, and we're getting an invalid answer from the server again. And now the app ID has to be set to a UUID, and last ID has to be set to something. It can't be empty. So we're now sending zu Frühstückszeit. I wasn't aware of how to generate app IDs yet, so I just took the one that I had captured from my device. Uh, contributor Pixilon and me learned this through trial and error. However, it was very bothersome because the server sometimes accepted and sometimes rejected the very same query. Uh, so this slow update cycle we'd noticed earlier turned out to be really bothersome and frustrating because you'd, you'd try something and then it would work and then you'd remove it again and it wouldn't work anymore and then you thought this was the cause for it. And actually, it was just this slow release uh, deploy cycle. Um, likely, or maybe they had just banned this app ID at this point in time, but I didn't realize, I'm not sure. Uh, rather, I believe the server was generally struggling and rejecting logins, because my DSP mobile installation with this app ID was also sometimes rejected. <laughs> um, round four. They seem to have reverted some of these changes later, which reaffirmed my belief that all DSP mobile installations were affected. Contributor Pixelon figured that device was now mandatory, which meant not empty. So we sent device A. I remembered to have at some point in time sent the words Kartoffel or Toaster as a device eventually. 
No, I thought we were smart. I added new functionality to this new system I explained earlier. Firstly, as a precaution, I could remotely activate sending the last date uh, in case that, I mean, remotely means that it happens when users click on look for a fix. Secondly, I could now set an array of headers to send to the server. And thirdly, we had discovered some alternative endpoints. To understand this, you first have to know that they have sold skin versions of DSB. Uh, so this is the normal DSB mobile. I showed it earlier already. This is the IHK skinned DSB mobile. It's accessible via two URLs that delivers the same data as this website. Uh, it also has a corresponding skinned Android app. So I configured so I could configure the endpoint the client would send the data to, because each of these had a different endpoint. And this app used one of these two. Um, however, this was tricky, because I had to prevent myself from giving myself the power to redirect users' queries to my own server. So I hard-coded four URL endpoints endpoint URLs, mobile web, IHK mobile, and app IHK BB into the app so I could switch between them using an integer. And I set it to the IHK mobile endpoint. I believe it was the very next day that IHK mobile and IHK app IHK BB endpoints were broken. Actually, they returned invalid data in a way that crashed my app. Whoops. Uh, and Suddenly, the web endpoint from the normal website was constantly moving to new locations. And there was a configuration.js script that contained where it was. So I hard-coded into the app uh, as a precaution in case I'd need it later, uh, a very specific way to, to find this location. And it was like behind this seventh quotation mark or something, clearly unreliable. And suddenly, the string was moved a line downwards, so it was now the ninth quotation mark. <laughs> Interesting. Um, also, this app st stopped working. It's still on the Play Store now, and it's still not working. This website is still available, and it's not working, because they broke their endpoint. <laughs> uh, this was around the time that this Google Play takedown notice reached us because apparently DSP Direct infringes the trademark of DSP. I don't feel qualified to comment on this, as I don't understand trademark law. I tried to ask for a specific clarification as to why they removed my app three times, but they never responded. Uh, by the way, that's a nice trick you can do with emails you don't like. You can just pretend you never received them. Uh, so a few days later, the website JavaScript, including configuration.js, was obfuscated in, in such a way that uh, I don't understand how it works. Uh, but it constantly evokes the debugger if the developer tools are open. You can, in theory, easily circumvent this by telling your browser to ignore breakpoints. This doesn't seem to work with Firefox, but it works in Chromium. I don't know why. I'm just going to assume we could have figured this out somehow. Uh, be that we could have had a web view running in the background if we absolutely had to, but fortunately, contributor Bixilon had come up with what is needed to talk to the mobile endpoint now, because it's more data. Through decompilation, he learned that it was being generated using the default Java UUID class, UUID dot random UUID dot two string. Also, device ID was mandatory. So I added spoof data. I took a random device ID from this list. I took a random OS version from anything between 4.02 and 10.0. I took random language, mostly German, sometimes English. And as a bundle ID, I took the package ID of DSP Mobile with an option to disable this via news in case it would get in the way somehow. And that was the end of that. Apparently, they stopped trying to prevent DSP Mobile from working. Apparently, after it releases, don't count to them, and it isn't worth their time, and maybe they're just uncreative. I could still think of a few ways to tell DSP Direct and DSP Mobile apart, but I'm clearly not going to tell them. <laughs> However,
However, just this month, Bixilon asked again why DSP Mobile was removed from the Play Store. Also because he believed we didn't violate German trademark law, contributor Jasmich, who uh, is sitting here, by the way, <laughs> uh, had uploaded DSP Direct to the Play Store again. And he received a rather interesting response. Sehr geehrter Herr Herzberger, dear Bixilon, vielen Dank für Ihre E-Mail. Leider sehen wir uns außerstande mit Ihnen einen qualifizierten Diskurs zu diesem, Dis zu diesem Thema zu führen. Uns sind weder Daten zu Ihnen noch zum Herrn Gunau bekannt. This means, unfortunately, we don't have your address and thus can't send you legally meaningful messages. Heißt, Sie wollen Einwurf einschreiben machen. Ebenfalls ist uns nicht klar, in welcher Rechtsbeziehung Sie zueinander stehen. We don't know about your legal relationship. This is a bit strange because I don't know either. According to my father, we might be a Gesellschaft bürgerlichen Rechts, but it's not exactly proof of familiarity with free software. Dennoch möchte ich im Folgenden unsere Position nochmals klar ausdrücken. Es ist weder Ihnen noch anderen Dritten gestattet, unsere interne DSB Mobile API für eigene Softwareprodukte abzufragen. Wir untersagen es Ihnen hiermit schriftlich und letztmalig. You may not use our internal API. I find it questionable whether a publicly facing API is to be considered internal. One might argue that it is only for communication between software they control. But I believe I control my device and my client installation, not them making the API not internal. Eine Inverbringung einer App mit gleichem oder ähnlichem Namen zu DSB ist Ihnen im europäischen Raum ebenfalls untersagt. Hier liegt Markenschutz durch Heineken Media vor. I don't understand trademark law. There are so many trademarks starting with this or just consisting of the letters DSB that with partially overlapping registered use cases and their trademark doesn't have distinctive character with Unterscheidungskraft and I just don't understand it. By the way, there are other trademark digitales schwarzes Brett, which is registered as a different one from DSB, was once rejected as a national trademark just because it didn't have distinctive character. Why can there be European trademark laws without uh, European trademarks without distinctive character? I do not understand and I'm not qualified to comment. Eine App-Bereitstellung im Store ist dabei eine geschäftliche Tätigkeit, ganz egal welchem wirtschaftlichen Zweck diese folgt. Es besteht Verwechslungsgefahr. Wir untersagen Ihnen hiermit die Benutzung der geschützten Marke DSB letztmalig. Um, the first part is true. I had gotten all wrong. It counts as geschäftlicher Verkehr when you provide a service, even for free, to the public. Uh, there's danger of confusion. This has to be about the letters DSB, right? Because as I explained earlier, our logo is completely unrelated. However, I'm not too certain that there really is danger of confusion that Heineken Media is directly affected by or exclusively affected by. After all, one could also believe that it is an app that provides access to something rel related to the Danish railway company. Of course it is not, but it's about recognition value, which is not something that DSB has exclusively for sure. Wir untersagen Ihnen hiermit die Benutzung der geschützten Wortmarke DSB letztmalig. Oh, ja, yeah, I already read it out. Sollten Sie weiterhin gegen unsere deutlichen Aufforderungen verstoßen, werden wir den Fall an unsere rechtliche Vertretung Herrn Dr. Selig übergeben. Dieser ist in dieser E-Mail bereits CC. Scaring us. Ebenfalls werden wir weiterhin gegen jede Veröffentlichung einer solchen App vorgehen. Entsprechend dadurch entstehende Kosten würden wir bei Ihnen als Schadensersatz geltend machen. Wir bitten um zwingende Beachtung. Mit freundlichen Grüßen. Andreas Nork. No, no, Nork? Hm. That's the CEO of Heineken Media. Yeah, we're famous. <laughs> we redirected this email to contributor Jasmich, who had DSB Direct up on the Play Store at this point of time, and he decided to take it down and apologize. Suddenly, and this was the very next day, he received an email that sounded a lot friendlier. Hallo, vielen Dank für Ihr Entgegenkommen. Wir finden Ihren Ansatz prinzipiell sehr gut. Allerdings hätten wir uns gewünscht, dass Sie uns vor Veröffentlichung und Nutzung unserer API um Erlaubnis gebeten hätten. If we had asked for permission, I'm quite sure we would not have received it. Dennoch möchten wir Ihr Engagement gerne würdigen und würden Sie daher gerne zu uns nach Hannover einladen. Vielleicht können Sie uns mit Ihren Ideen helfen, eine bessere App zu bauen. Vielleicht finden wir ja sogar einen Weg, dass Sie daran mitbauen. Gerne fördern wir junge Talente. Wir würden uns freuen, Sie kennenlernen zu dürfen. 
Ich freue mich auf Ihre Rückmeldung. Mit freundlichen Grüßen, Norg. I'd rather, I'd rather leave this largely uncommented. I don't know exactly what they want from us, but I guess we'll have to see. And that's the dramatic cliffhanger that we have to end our talk with uh, for the events are yet to unroll. Uh, there's one thing that I can learn from this. Don't use other people's trademarks, because trademark law is too complicated. <laughs> Apologizing instead of being rebellious seems to work better, even if the thought of conflict entreats you and you really do believe you're in the right, you probably just misunderstood the law. Alternatively, exclusively do such things anonymously. Decide beforehand what you want to put your name on. Thank you. <laughs>